Good morning, church family. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. All right. Well, a smattering of applause is a great way to start church. I'm so glad you're here today. My name is Greg McElroy. I'm the pastor here at New Lagoon First Baptist. We are so happy that you're here with us today. We have several people who uh, are out. There's a lot of uh, sickness going around, so make sure that you pray for our church family and also know that they're able to join us online today. We're grateful for that. And uh, I just want to say it's really good to be here. If this is one of your first times of being here, there should be a card in the pew right in front of you. It says connect on the top of it. If you would fill that out and uh, just place it in that box on the wall before you leave today, that just lets us know you are here. Uh, helps us learn your name. Uh, if you have anything you want us to be praying about, you can put that on that card as well. And uh, just kind of helps us get connected. That's why it says connect on the top of it. And so if you don't mind doing that, I would really appreciate that. Um, also, just to let you know, we have a few things going on. Uh, one of which is tomorrow is the homecoming parade here in town. Now, we have a float that we will be in that. Technically, it's a pickup. Um, so it's not really a flow. You're not going to have to get on a, a trailer or anything like that. We do need some folks that are riding in that truck, waving at people, wearing your Look Out First Baptist shirt. If you don't have one of those, we still have some of those available. Um, so see me after the service. We'll get that to you. Um, also, we need some people who are like kind of walking alongside the truck and uh, high-fiving people and handing out candy. After the homecoming parade is over, our church is uh, partnering with the rest of the Ministerial Alliance, and we are providing a kind of a pep rally tailgate thing going on at the parking lot um, at the high school football field. And so we need people who can cook hot dogs and wrap them up, okay? And then you just kind of have to stand there and high five folks and uh, cheer for our, our kids, all right? Which I know you do so well, so that should be pretty easy. Uh, but we need people who would be available to cook hot dogs, wrap them, wave at folks, high five, whatever it is. You know, there's a spot for anybody in that in that process. So please, if you're interested in doing that, uh, I'm going to have you see Ryan Harris right after the service is over. He's our youth minister, and uh, he'll get you lined out. Parade lineup starts at 5:45 tomorrow, and uh, and we will be up there at the football field with the grill and everything that. So if you're wondering what that uh, time commitment would be, if you're cooking, uh, that's what it would be. See Ryan and get signed up. Also, two weeks from today, our men's ministry is having a men's prayer breakfast. So if you would uh, mark that on your calendars, be here um, at 830 that morning. We're going to have our prayer time together and uh, enjoy a time of uh, just eating breakfast. So if you have any questions about that, see Josh Jackson right back here. On the guitar, on the electric guitar today. Woo! All right. Uh, there are so many different things going on. I'm grateful for you all. Would you please stand up? Uh, as we start our service, we have our ushers come forward to take our offering today. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that we do when we uh, have this time of, of uh, worship is to give of our tithes and our offerings, read God's word together, pray, and also sing praises to him. And so at this time, uh, as we get our service started, I'm going to have Miss Sue Kersey is going to be leading us in, uh, with God's word and then a time of prayer. And then we're going to pass the plate, sing praises to the Lord and have a great time and worship with one another. Sue? I'm reading Ephesians. I'm reading out of Ephesians. It's Ephesians 2.18. For through him we have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on a foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as a cornerstone. Dear Lord, we just thank you for the privilege of coming in your house today, Lord. We just thank you for your salvation that you've provided for us. We just ask, Lord, that you be glorified today in all that we do and all that we sing. And give Greg the message today, Lord, and let us have ears to hear. If there be anyone here that's not a Christian, Lord, may today be the day to give their heart and life to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. 
Anybody already feel like attacked, right? Just, okay, there we go. All right, I'm just, we're all, there are so many people that, that are already like, okay, you're meddling already, Greg, so just chill out. Uh, I'm telling you right now, whenever we look at scripture and we think about our call to be who God wants us to be, it's a very dangerous book anyway. And it's very offensive too. And those who don't know the Lord, uh, whenever you tell them, look, 
you, the things in your life are going to lead you down a road of destruction and despair and eventually a separation from God for eternity in hell, that's pretty offensive, right? Uh, like there's, That's not like all uh, rainbows and, and teddy bears, right? Nobody, nobody wants to hear what I'm doing in my life is a pathetic excuse for a life. Even if I'm a successful person, even if I try my hardest, you're telling me no matter what, the road that I'm on, unless I put my trust in Jesus, leads to destruction and hell for eternity. Yeah, because that's the truth that we find in God's word. And everything outside of his promises and what we read and the, the God-breathed truth of his word is a lie. Everything outside of this and what we're promised here is something that we're just chasing. It's a mask. And so oftentimes we tend to want to do more and, and, and be more and those are admirable things in this life. You should want to be successful. How many of you would consider yourself a successful person? How many of you wanted to raise your hand, but then in the in the back of your mind you thought, no, I'm pathetic. No, don't raise your hand about that. <laughs> don't raise your hand about that. I would have, though, to be honest with you, because the struggle that we experience in our life is that attack, that lie that we have from the enemy. It's always telling you you're not good enough, even though you might be successful. There's no blessings for you. This life can be pretty overwhelming. We have to be in God's word. The truth of it, every time you're told a lie by the enemy, he doesn't want to make things inconvenient for you. He wants to destroy and devour, to kill you. And I say that so seriously. He's not making things uncomfy for you. He's trying to get your eyes off of the goal that is a relationship with Christ because he wants to end you. He wants to bring your life to complete destruction and ruin. So if we're in God's word, we have to realize how dangerous it really is. Whenever you place your trust and your faith and the one true God, the one who can give you guidance and, and encouragement, hope. It's so dangerous to trust him because now I have to deal with my stuff and I don't like that. And I'm going to have to address people that I don't really like. or I'm going to have to apologize to people and deal with stuff. And I'm going to have to just abandon everything else for the sake of the call of the gospel of Jesus. And that's really scary. And it's a very dangerous thing. And you need to know that. But whenever you are looking at things as an achievement thing, I'm going to tell you the Bible is an extremely dangerous book for overachievers. It's so dangerous. When a God-loving, passionate, type A person, am I talking to you? Read your Bible and every command feels like a personal assignment. i got to get that done. I'm falling behind. Oh, if I'm not doing this well enough, then what if God's not happy about that? And before long, you're just like, you know, just shaking and trembling and you don't ever feel like it's enough. And so you tend to go harder in everything that you do and you want to make sure that you're achieving enough for God's glory. You know, personal growth, evangelism, discipleship, all of those things abound whenever you're trying to be an overachiever. But listen, whenever you're whenever that's your only goal is to be a, a, be successful and that's it. Instead of being conformed into the likeness of Jesus, then what happens is you start to wear a mask in your life. You overachieve it. You might strive for perfection. You might hope to gain acceptance from other people and, and praise for doing things really, really well or perfectly. But I want you to know that self-esteem, it just relies too heavily on being perfect. Which means whenever you make a mistake, you're going to over-internalize everything. And the enemy doesn't just have a foot in the door, he's kicked the thing open. And he's going to be going crazy in your life. The need for perfect perfection can also cause this constant state of anxiety 
for you. You all know that I struggle with anxiety and depression in my life. I'm pretty open about that. Uh, it's not a, a badge of honor, but I just share that because I want you to know, one, I'm real. Two, if you're going through something, you have somebody to talk to. I kind of get it, maybe. And, uh, and also just to know how to pray for me. But listen, if you, have, uh, if you are in that kind of a mode of achieving more, even perfection in your life, it will not help with anxiety in your life. In fact, God wants you to take that mask of the overachiever today and lay it aside. I, I've thought about the overachiever. It can always, it doesn't have to necessarily be a bad thing. So let, don't misunderstand me today. I, again, with the mask that we're talking about, there's some good in that too, right? Uh, a, a great example of an overachiever in scripture would be Joseph. So Joseph, you know, he, he grew up uh, there in, uh, in Egypt and he was uh, one of the 12 tribes of Israel, the son of Jacob. Um, and uh, his wife. And, and listen, he was known as the righteous one. That was kind of his nickname. How many of you could say your nickname was the righteous one? Yeah, me either. Okay. Probably the, the goofy one or the over sarcastic one. I might get that one. The, I don't know. It's starting to sound like a friend's uh, season of episodes here. The one with the gray hair, right? And that's me, right? I don't know, but like, I don't know that I would be called the righteous one. One of the things I would love to be described as at the end of my life would be the consistent one. And that's just because like, I want my boys to know the same man at home as they do whenever I'm cheering for them at state band contests or if I'm watching an OU debacle on TV. I want to be the consistent person in their life that even if I'm cut off in traffic or if we're sitting down for dinner, they get the same dad no matter what. I want that even more with my heavenly father. I want him to say you're consistent in your walk with my son Jesus and you want to become more like him in your life. I want to be consistent in my life. Joseph was known as the righteous one. So even from the very beginning, his father, um, you know, he had a lot of favor with him. And, and he was, if you remember, the beloved son as well. And so he goes on. He's, he finds favor. His dad gives him a coat of many colors. We know this part of the story, right? Uh, and then his brothers get really angry about that. Even though he's like doing, he's achieving great things. He's known as righteous. He's beloved. And then his brothers start getting jealous. And so what do they do? They beat him up and they sell him. Do we, do we remember this story about Joseph? Okay. If not, here you go. They, they sell him. Uh, and what happens then is he's sold to these traders. Eventually he goes to Egypt or he's sold to Potiphar. One of the, the uh, he's, uh, one of uh, King Pharaoh's ministers or, or uh, workers there. And so he's there working um, for Potiphar. Uh, he's going to now be in this role of interpreting dreams and, and leading for him and taking care of, of, of different things. And he was just beat up and sold by his brothers. And then all of a sudden, now he's in t uh, interpreting and he goes through two years of this. Then all of a sudden he tells Pharaoh's uh, dreams of being uh, of of being overthrown and and Pharaoh appoints him and it just kind of goes on. Eventually, uh, his brothers come. They uh, want, they they meet again because they need stuff. They need food and there's a lot of famine and peril in the land. And then Joseph comes along and he's like, Hey, these are my brothers. These are my family. There's this whole reunion. Um, he takes care of his family, there's this overachieving that happens in Joseph's life. Almost like he has to be perfect, but at the same time, he did a lot of great things and he was righteous and God showed him favor in his life and used him in a mighty way. There's something around this idea of forgiveness also in Joseph's life. He forgives his family. He forgives his brothers who beat him up, left him for dead, then sold him into slavery and all of these things that we have in our life, we need to remember that the overachieving 
aspect of that could have been one of those things that was his eventual peril. I think of another. Now listen, I know at least for one, Stan is gonna he's gonna be like, I don't know about this. So Stan, feel free to, to pipe in, okay? The mask for today, the overachiever mask. The best example I could come up with was Batman. Alright? I'm Batman, right? Now Batman was clearly the overachiever, right? In his life, he, he's one of the greatest detectives. I mean, some people, Stan might even argue the greatest detective of all time. Uh, his sheer brains and his drive and his life took care of everything in, in making sure of what was going on in his life. He had intense, great, inherited wealth in his life. You know, he was like a bazillionaire, right? Plenty of money. In fact, he built a bat cave. Just because he wanted to do something good. He wanted to take care of Gotham. And so he has all this wealth. By the way, he's pretty buff. He's not, he's probably a little smaller than I am. Uh, but uh, like to work out a lot. This is natural. He had to work hard for his buff physique. He was working. He loved to work out. He loved the, the, the idea of being the strong person, right? He believed in public service. Right? He was always, I mean, really, if you think through, he wanted to make sure that he took care of everybody. Right? And so he was serving, and he was, even in the, in the midst of the night, he would swoop in and take care of things. Hey, listen, he also liked to network quite a, quite a lot. He had a lot of friends. He had friends in high places, friends in low places. Wherever he was at, he was meeting people, not as Batman, but he was making sure that he had plenty of networking possibilities. He also wanted to improve all the time. How many of you want to be better tomorrow than you are today? Okay, listen, if you didn't raise your hand and you thought, no, I want to be a little more pathetic tomorrow than I am today, let's talk after the service, all right, because we... We'll, we'll help you with counseling. I promise you. I've been there. I understand. But in all seriousness, you want to be a little better tomorrow than you are today. I hope you're a little bit better today than you were yesterday. In fact, you're here today. You took one step closer to the Lord today. Well done. Sometimes that's all you can muster. I'm proud of you. That's great. You, you want to make sure that you improve in your life. Batman did too. He was just a regular guy who takes what he has and does crazy things to make things better in his life. Maybe the greatest overachiever of all time. In the you know comic book sense of things. And so in all the things that we, we think through in this, I want to ask you some questions today. And then we're going to just kind of pop in and out of scripture. With this, whenever it comes to overachieving, one of the questions I would ask you is this. Why do I want to achieve this? Why do you want to achieve whatever it is you're pushing so hard to do? Why is it that you want to do that thing? If you're looking at your life as a Christian and you're trying to be more like Christ, to be more like Christ and to make sure that his glory is shining in your life then okay but are you really focusing on that most of the time are you just trying to be the best teacher are you trying to be the best fisherman are you trying to be the best whatever it is that your job is are you trying to be the best dad the best mom those things are good they're admirable. But really, why do you want to achieve that? Why is it that you want to do those things? In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, it should be on the screen. And it says this. So, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all of this to the glory of God. So those things that are good in your life, let me ask you, why is it that you're doing it? Here, when Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians, he's making sure that we understand whatever the drive is in your heart. 
It'll be the answer of why you're doing it. If you're driving to just be the best, whatever, the best OU football fan, the best dad, the best fill in the blank, then the question then is, what's the desire of your heart? Because if the desire of your heart is only those things, just to be the best dad or to be the best superhero or whatever, and you put your overachieving mask on and the string gets in the way and you just struggle and you, it feels a little bit plastic for you in your life. And when Paul says, so whatever it is that you're doing, do those things. Whether it's eating or, or, or drinking or whatever you do is literally what he says. Or whatever you do, do it all to the better good of Gotham. No, that's not what he says. That'd be crazy if Gotham was in scripture like that. Stan would love that. But I'm, I'm just, no, he says, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. Well, what does that look like in your life? Well, it's not about you. I can promise you that. It's not about whether or not you get to be the one on the 10 o'clock news, you know, that saved the day or anything like that. The overachiever puts that mask on and says, that's what I want. I want this recognition, and I want it to be about me, be about my glory in my life. This is ridiculous, is it not, to watch your pastor preach in a Batman mask and hold it up? But so often... We do that. Why? We should do everything for the glory of God. Well, the next question I would have for you is this. Is the goal just to prove someone wrong? Have you ever done something just to make sure somebody else, they, they saw that I mean, that's not me? I am guilty of this a lot. I'm guilty of this a lot. All right? I, just from different... Uh, people who have wronged me in my life, different, uh, uh, just, I'm, I'm broken too, y'all. I, it, I mean, I'm just like you. I, I'm not any better, but there's sometimes we just want to prove something to somebody else. And I'm, I, I think about, I almost didn't say this, but do you remember on Saturday Night Live, I'm about to date myself because most, half the congregation won't even know this. Remember on Saturday Night Live, Stuart Smalley uh, was a character and he sat in front of a mirror. Right, and there was one time whenever he had Michael Jordan on there. He's the goat. I, I, I mean, I appreciate it. He's the greatest basketball player of all time, right? Mm -hmm. And he's sitting there, and Stuart Smalley's like a little encouragement counseling corner was uh, that you are. It's a you're good enough, you're smart enough, and doggone it, people like me, right? And he made Michael Jordan look at that mirror and say, because I'm good enough. I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. And they, they, they're they laughing the whole time. They broke character. It's a great clip. Go back and watch it. But I think about that's kind of what we tend to do. We just try to prove something that we're good enough, that we're strong enough, and we have to just show that my dad will know that I'm a better man. Or I'm going to prove to so-and-so that I'm the best worker they've ever seen. Or I'm the best boss or whatever. I'm going to be a better husband than their husband so that my wife will still look at me and go, oh, what, what are we trying to prove in our life? In Galatians chapter 1, verse 10, it says, for, I, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. You know what Paul is saying right here? What am I doing with my life? Who am I trying to prove something to? Is it to man or is it God himself? Because if I'm just trying to make everybody else happy and think that, doggone it, I'm good enough, then I'm really not a servant of God, is literally what Scripture says. I'm serving God. Man, I'm serving my own ideas, and I'm making those things an idol. Then I throw this stupid mask on again, and I say, I'm going to win. I'm going to take care of everything, and I'm going to make sure I prove to the world 
that we've got this. I've got this. I'm Batman. There you go. Saw a phone come up. Everybody's looking for the phone. Listen, Philippians chapter 4, it ends with a verse that you know well. But have you ever read the verses coming into that? Listen to this. In Philippians 4.10, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. This is Paul speaking to the church there in verse 11. Not that I am speaking of being in need or I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Verse 12, I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Many of you, maybe uh, you've seen Philippians 4.13 uh, on a sports shirt somewhere or something like that. I love that there's a lot of memes out there on social media. And they're like, you know, uh, how are we going to get this Jeep over this cliff without wrecking it? And they're like, well, first of all, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? Or, you know, how is it that you're going to dump this basketball, Greg? You're only five foot seven. First of all, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that's what we kind of tend to do, right? We use scripture in this way where we're like, oh, well, you know what? I'm just going to try to prove something to someone. But did you hear what Paul was saying for that? I rejoice in the Lord. I've been through everything. And you all were concerned about me. And I appreciate that. And I'm speaking and letting you know that whatever happens in my life, I've learned to be content. I don't have to be the overachiever all the time. I don't have to wear this mask for you, for anybody, because I'm not trying to prove anything. Because I've learned the secret of this life. No matter how high it's been, no matter how low it's been, whether I was hungry or I was in jail or whatever, I can do all of this. All. Anything. Because of Jesus. Because he gives me strength to do that. I'm not trying to prove somebody wrong. I'm trying to make sure that I'm serving and pleasing God and him only. Uh, so the next question I would say is this. Whenever you have the overachieving mask, what drives your joy? Uh, I mean, Paul just kind of talked about, like, I, I've learned all of these things no matter what's going on. And, and he also says right before that in chapter 4 of Philippians, verses 4 through 7, he says this, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say this, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts in your minds, Christ Jesus. What drives your joy? Paul is trying to make sure that we understand that true joy doesn't come in being good enough or better than anybody else or perfect. It comes in a relationship with Jesus because what we must do is we rejoice in who he is in our life. When you realize that you're broken, whenever you realize, yes, you might have been born into like certain money or uh, situations, or maybe you have certain talents, and you can build a back cave, whatever it may be. But listen, I need you to understand something. Whatever it is, you rejoice in the Lord, no matter what. And then let everything be known to everybody else. I don't think you need to go around and be the dark night at night and go around and say like, oh, my bad. Right? Or whatever it is. You don't need to live under a false pretense of something that you're not. What you need to realize is the joy that you are hiding underneath is not something that is a mask. It is something that is from God. And only from God. And then whenever you bring those things to God in prayer and you submit your life to him. Then you experience something in your life. Paul says is peace. 
a peace of God that surpasses all understanding. You can't explain it. You just can't explain it. Have you ever tried to be the achiever or the overachiever and you fell flat on your face? Okay, I'm going to tell you the time. You ready? Picture it. This is like the Golden Girls. Picture it. Purcell, Oklahoma. I was in sixth grade. I was in, no, I was in seventh grade. One or the other. I've tried to, I've tried to block this out, all right? But I was uh, selected, told, that I was going to play the part of Frosty the Snowman for the Christmas play. Um, and they thought it would be a great idea if Frosty, because if you've seen that cartoon, he's a snowman, just in case you forgot that, uh, and he's, he's on ice and snow, that Frosty, the part of Frosty played by your pastor, Greg, would roller skate in um, and do a couple of... I don't know what they thought, triple Lutzes or something. I don't know. Um, and and then I would like, you know, kind of dance around. And my mom made this great, incredible, I mean, like Broadway would be proud. Frosty the Snowman outfit had uh, like, uh, I think I had three parts, you know, like a good classic Frosty and lots of padding and everything like that. And I roller skate out. Um, I struggle uh, in rehearsal or anything like that. I practiced and practiced roller skating. By the way, one small detail, I can't roller skate, could not roller skate, okay? And I was trying to tell my mom, like, this is a bad idea, and she was like, this is a big deal, and you're going to make sure that you honor this process. Okay, we don't quit. Well, your pastor, Frosty, the snowman, came time for the big performance in front of the town at Purcell Middle School, and I came roller skating out. Let me remind you that this was a performance with choir and show choir, and the whole stands were full. And uh, I forget that there are microphone cables that are taped down, you know, on the floor. And my roller skate kind of hits that, and I kind of, you know, stumble and get across, and then my heart's racing. And so I go to do my little spin, and I just wipe out. Frosty, the, I mean, this, this splat man, I guess, it, I don't know. And I, it should have been snowman, but I, I was a puddle right there in the middle of the middle school auditorium, and I wanted to just, I literally wanted to just melt into the concrete. Thankfully, that, that costume had a lot of padding, so I didn't get hurt physically, but man, the emotional damage I took that day, I'm, I'm 43, I feel it right now in front of you. Oh, I was overwhelmed. I felt defeated. It was my time to shine. I worked so hard to be in that moment. I overachieved, and I still failed. I stand in front of you to say this. That's a silly example, but if you've lost a loved one, or you've gone through a divorce, you got fired, laid off, Life came at you fast. You have a strained relationship with someone who you love and shouldn't be put out. The peace that God can give you in those moments is deeper and more real than anything that I can even explain. It's beyond understanding that God can give you a peace that's so deep. Why you might want to just melt away and hide your feet. He wants to pick you up, put you back together. So the last question I would say this today, and the overachieving mask is this. Well, who gets the glory in your life then? So who gets your glory, the glory in your life? In Philippians chapter 2, still in the same letter where Paul writes this in Philippians 2 verse 1. He says, so if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection... And sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord with one uh, and of one mind. 
Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count yourselves more significant, others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but to the interests of others. If, if Christ is really in you, yes, you want to be more like him. That's called holiness, and that's biblical. And eventually, through the sanctification process of getting into God's word, and becoming more like Jesus, eventually, when we get to heaven, we'll achieve that. But you won't achieve that in this life. I'm sorry. But you need to know that in the process of this, God gets all of the glory in your life. You don't look at your own selfishness or your own ambitions. But what we do is we point others to Jesus in everything that we have. There's some things that tend to happen for the overachiever. I'm going to read through this list. I got this on a, on a biblical counseling website. There's some predictable things that happen to the overachiever. You ready? The individual experiences spiritual growth. You've been there? Have you experienced spiritual growth in your life? Then the growth is very satisfying and motivating, sometimes intoxicating, is what they say. You ever been there? You've ever been so on fire for the Lord and your growth is just going, and it's almost like a drug. Other people notice and they affirm the achiever, and that's motivating as well. And so it feeds that even more. Opportunities for growth and ministry multiply in your life, and they crowd out a balanced life eventually. And then mild life disruptions begin to occur that can be managed because of your high capacity in your life and you're pretty good at those kinds of things. And then what happens is opportunities for growth and ministry begin to compete with one another. And now all of a sudden, ah, do I choose this or that? And you have an overcrowded life. And then life disruption becomes greater as the conflict is experienced in the individual's spiritual life, which is now very core to your identity. I'm a follower of Christ, but I'm also a doer, maybe too much so. And then frustration grows towards the church and those who are being served. And now everybody listen to this warning. Cynicism grows toward other Christians who aren't as committed to personal growth and ministry. Then personal growth and ministry mutate to having a cynical tone, being focused on personal achievement, and all is abandoned. This is from biblical counselors who see this time and time again. Yes, we're the church. Yes, we serve. Yes, we're doers of the word, not just hearers only. But friends, listen to me. The overachiever, if they're not careful, it becomes all about the act instead of the one who's driving everything. We have to have our guard up. Overachiever is a very real thing. We have to be aware of those things. I'm going to ask you this. Our time of response to today is going to be a little different, but I'm just going to ask you this. One, have you ever given your life to Jesus? Have you ever trusted him, asked him?